we're into part four of the publication from Cambridge University Press, Lars Fisher's work in the study on anti-Semitism amongst the uh, socialists of Imperial Germany, 19th century. That is to say the revisionists or social democrats. And here we go. The second great misunderstanding. In a truly groundbreaking but still oddly neglected study that makes it painfully palpable just how brilliant an impulse giver we have lost in its author, the late Amos Funkenstein, identified as, quote, the only sound political theories of Jewish emancipation, those which, against the consensus communists, argued for the disjunction of emancipation and assimilation. Oh, breakthrough, unquote. This disjunction was rarely suggested, yet for Frankenstein, Marx's Zero Jugendfrage was one of the few texts that had done so. He conceded that the text stench made it difficult to appreciate its interesting core, but then demonstrated convincingly that this interesting core indeed hinges crucially on the disjunction of emancipation and assimilation. Yet this was a disjunction so incomprehensible to all those who subsequently professed to follow in Marx's footsteps that they never even realized that his argument in Zero Judenfrage had directly targeted the, to his mind, ridiculous notion that formal emancipation effectively presumed assimilation. Yeah. The basic message of the first part of Der Judenfrage is clear enough. The liberal state, to stay with Funkenstein's paraphrase, purports to stand above all particular social interest groups. Hmm. Supposedly, yes, according to liberalism. In reality, though, it expresses and institutionalizes the atomization of society. Uh -huh the freedom or equality which it propagates are nothing but a tool to make the individual free to sell himself, his labor as a commodity in the market, labor market. The Jews, uh, quote, cannot but be emancipated into this state, which cannot let either religion or family stand in the way of political emancipation of man, his transformation into a commodity. It's not the Jews, then, quote, who have to change in order to be granted emancipation. It is the state which has to change. Oh, yeah, this is a line that socialism is going to liberate all national minorities from racism and from anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. as, <clears throat> as Funkenstein rather intriguingly suggests, it seems as if Marx's argument is a caricaturized version of Mendelssohn's. Mendelssohn had assumed that it was not the Jews who needed to change, but the state adhering to its own ideals. Marx suggested that the change really required of the state was that it become its true ugly self. Moreover, Marx, like Mendelssohn, also sees the Jews as better fit than any other social segment for the civil state. Yet here, too, Marx substituted what he held to be the ugly truth for Mendelssohn's idealized vision. The Jews are particularly well prepared for the civil state because they are the very incarnation of its true essence, namely the atomization of society into conflicting economic interest groups. Unquote. In this sense, the civil state is a Jewish state. I don't know what that means. Now, whatever else one might possibly be able to say about the way in which Sarah Judenfrage was subsequently appropriated in the socialist movement, this much is clear. That the appropriation was always unquestionably predicated 
on the assumption that emancipation and assimilation were two sides of the one and the same coin. Okay, I'm going to drink here. Um, this obviously flew in the face of Marx's central argument in Zer Judenfrage. Of course, the demise of capitalism and bourgeois society would spell a form of human emancipation that would lead Jews and non-Jews alike into totally uncharted territory. Yet, that very process would render the concept of assimilation utterly obsolete, since it would not only bring with it the demise of a distinct Jewish existence, but would also transcend all distinct forms of non-Jewish existence in their current form. There would admittedly no longer be anything specifically Jewish, but there would no longer be anything specifically non-Jewish either, to which those who had previously been Jews could assimilate. We may or may not find this vision attractive or realistic, but what is crucial for our discussion here is the fundamental fact that the subsequent appropriation of their Judenfrage in the socialist movement, where it did occur, was clearly predicated precisely on the conventional notion that emancipation and assimilation were inextricably linked. This ostensible appropriation was based on the very consensus communists against which Marx had directed the main thrust of Zera Judenfrage in the first place, and thus blatantly disregarded its central argument. Okay, break time. We now resume the reading and commentary upon the socialist response to anti-Semitism in imperial German society and state. Okay, the third great misunderstanding of Zara Judenfrage from Karl Marx of 1843-1844. If it was a foregone conclusion that Jewry would eventually disappear as a distinct entity, then those who failed to assimilate promptly enough and instead insisted upon the legitimacy of a distinct Jewish existence were willfully setting themselves against the inevitable course of history and the triumph of socialism that would come with it. This notion found its complement in the accusation that Jews were betraying the cause of general emancipation to maintain their own particular interests. This indictment played a particularly prominent role during the period in which the party was banned by the Sozialist Tengizetst, uh -huh. 1878-1890. <clears throat> the literature generally treats social democracy's insistence that the socialistic ten gazettes, yes, that's the imprisonment of the socialists, it would seem to say, <clears throat> socialistic gazettes and political anti-Semitism were the product of one and the same reactionary tendency as evidence for its anti judeophobic integrity. <clears throat> Lucian Seppo seeks to underscore this notion by contrasting the social democratic response to the socialistic Gesenst with the response of the bulk of organized Catholicism to Bismarck's campaign against it, the Kulturkampf. As she explains, Many Catholics were generally anguished by the culture conf and readily turned on the Jews as an even weaker minority, scapegoating them to compensate for their own sense of exclusion and frustration. The Sozialisten Gesenst, by contrast, generally instilled a sense of pride and superior, superiority in most social democrats. <clears throat> Hence, they felt no need to indulge in any scapegoating, she suggests and instead emphasize the common cause of all those affected by discrimination. 
This line of argument automatically presupposes, though, that the only motive the Social Democrats could have had in turning on Jewry would have been the desire to vent a sense of inferiority provoked by the socialist, socialistischen Gesenst. In fact, however, it was the very sense of superiority that tended to drive the socialist Paul polemics against Jewry in this period. Now, it is by no means my intention to deny that solidarity among social groups denied constitutional rights is always the most honorable basis of, on which to fight for those rights. <clears throat> Yet this particular discourse was overdetermined from the outset by a more elementary and deep-seated distrust of Jewry, and thus offered yet another opportunity to rationalize and articulate anti-Jewish preconceptions. <clears throat> a text particularly well-suited to illustrate this is the pamphlet Der Wahrheit, die Ehre, ein Betrag zur Judenfrage in Deutschland, I'm calling a spade a spade a contribution on the Jewish question in Germany. It was published early in 1881 under the pseudonym Wilhelm Revel by Wilhelm Hassenclever. Hassenclever, 1837-1889, had been Schweitzer's successor as the final president of the ADAV from 1871 until its merger with the Eisenacher STAP at the Congress of Gotha in May 1875. I wonder what those things are. Okay, it's explained here. The Allgemeine Deutsche Arbeiterin, General German Workers Association, yeah, labor unions, had been founded by Ferdinand Lassalle in Leipzig in 1863 and formed the indigenous non-Marxist strand within the early German labor movement. Oh. The Social, Social Demokratische Arbeiterpartei, Social Democratic Workers' Party, was established by Babel and Liebknecht in 1869 and represented the Marxist strand within the early German labor movement that was affiliated with the First International. In Gotha, he was initially elected as joint chairman of the United SAPD and subsequently even took over as the party's executive chairman, but then resigned in October 19, 1875, <laughs> after his constituency party asked him to choose between his post in the Volkstag and his role set it through the Hamburg Atona of Volksblatt. Having represented the, represented the ADAV and the SAPD in the Norddeutsche Deutsch, Deutsche Reichstag, and then the Reichstag for many years, the parliament, he finally resigned in June 1882, 1888, and died on 3rd of July, 1889. The scholarly community was only alerted to the fact that Hesenklever was the author of Der Wachtlich der Reier in 1889, nor does this seem to have been general knowledge when the pamphlet was published and we knew nothing of its impact at the time. Austin Clever was hardly the most sophisticated social democratic leader, and Nahman has conventionally, convincingly described him as the one who best is, expressed the opinion and mood of the rank and file member within the leadership. It is here that the significance of their Wachlerer lies. Should anyone be tempted to consider what follows the preserve of the socialist left, we might note in passing that the articles collected in the pamphlet was first published in a left liberal Freisingen paper in December 1880. <clears throat> the pamphlet was certainly ambitious, wide ranging in its scope. Its two central themes were Jewry's responsibility for the anti Semitic upsurge and the hypocrisy with which it stood on its own dignity while betraying the general cause of justice and emancipation. What, Heisenklaffer began, had actually happened to make everyone in the entire German Reich speak of nothing other than the Jewish question. Answer. A court preacher, a Stoker, convened meetings in Berlin and several other German localities in which he campaigned against the Jews, and that in a manner that was in many ways extremely irresponsible. Yet some of the things the court preacher made an issue of in the course of this campaign were justified as even the most eager friends of the Jews in the Prussian Diet conceded. 
Indeed, if one looked at the recent debates in the Prussian Chamber of Deputies, it was clear that, quote, more than 200 deputies, the majority, in other words, belong to the anti-Semites, unquote. If one were to subscribe to the common cliché propounded, propounded by the liberal papers, one would have to count all these gentlemen among the ignorant masses. Not only the deputies, though, the students too, at least those who participate in public and political life, are predominantly on Stoker's and von Trischke's side. And yet, Huss and Clever explain, when the students participate in the culture cone or the attacks on social democracy, they were praised by the liberal press dominated by Judah for the superlative patriotic intelligence on which one could depend and rely as the herald of the future. Now, of course, that the students do not want to sing from the liberal Semitic hymn sheet, one treats them like children. That was Hessenklever. In the Christian social movement, Hessenklever explained, had brought the Jewish question to the fore, mainly due to the ineptitude of the liberal press, which, instead of hushing up the Christian social assemblies or reporting on them in a decent manner, saw to it that the wildest cracket was unleashed, and conspicuously by Jewish reporters at that. Stoker's activities, he's claimed, had almost stopped to draw any attention. Then, however, analyzing the situation correctly, the Christian social agitator turned to coarse, but in many ways justified, attacks against the liberal press, and the latter walked into the trap by reciprocating his abuse. Now Stoker thundered against the liberal Jewish press, and quite sinfully at that, skillfully at that. <clears throat> the Jews in the employ of the liberal press felt insulted and grumbled all the more and lied in all keys. Now Stoker attacked the Jews and Jewry itself, his agitation gradually become interesting and exciting. There could be no doubt. Hansen Clever conceded that envy, jealousy, laziness, and ineptitude often help unleash hatred against Jews. Yet it was equally beyond doubt that this hatred is also unleashed, and indeed intensified, to wild hatred by the particular ruthlessness in which the Jews engage in the commercial struggle. Oh my. So it's all our fault. Oh. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to take a break here. Too much to take. Okay, to continue now. Okay, there was no there was no denying. He explained, that's uh, Hassan Kleva, that the Jews are superior to the Germanic people in the exploitation of the economic conditions. Oh, hence the better economic status of the Jews, hence their greater wealth, and hence their dominance in all economic affairs. Hence also the envy, the jealousy, and the hatred against the Jews. The economic or social issues apart. As in Clever continued, another aspect of the Jewish question needed to be addressed, namely the race question. Is then, the quotation, is then the Jewish race in general so much more diligent, so much more able than the Germanic race that the Christian Germanic people would need to tear their hair out in despair? Wow, what a concept, the German Germanic people. That's what I thought was the problem. Answer, no, no, and no again. Physically, their Germanic tribe is indubitably stronger than the Jewish tribe, and intellectually, it is more substantial too. We hardly need to demonstrate the former, hardly. As far as the intellect in general is concerned, the Germanic people are superior to the Jews. As far as the intellectual capacity pertaining to the economic and purely social sphere 
is concerned, however, the Jews are far superior to the Germanic people. This is borne out by the names, the great hallowed names, Rothschild and Bleichroder. Right. This is due in part to hereditary characteristics, in quotes, in part to characteristics acquired in the course of historical development. Among the historical factors, one had to count the Jews' ruthlessness in the commercial struggle provoked by the manifold persecutions and among the hereditary ones, their Asiatic cunning that borders on dishonesty, a hereditary characteristic that the Jews of earlier times share with Phoenicians and now with the Armenians. To make, unquote, to make things worse, he says, the Germanic people in general, when they came into contact with the Jews, were afflicted with a clumsy honesty. All right. Yet more recently, the Germanic tradesmen and merchants, merchants have acquired from the Jews their ruthlessness in the commercial struggle and their Asiatic cunning that borders on dishonesty. The good qualities of the Jews, however, their diligence, thrift, and sobriety have drawn little attention. It's never been to a wine party at Pesach. Thus, the so very unpleasant tone came into German commercial life without the Germanic, Germanic people having managed to shake off Jewish control or at least gain equality with them. Hmm. How far this has gone was this demonstrated by the fact that so very few businessmen are involved in the current anti-Semitic movement in Germany. For this, there was an easy explanation. They, quote, have presumably become aware of the fact that in their commercial dealings, they have become, quote, unquote, Jewish. For they, quote, the commoners, peasants, and workers, unquote, on the other hand, anti-Semitism was unattractive because it was neither here nor there for them whether their exploitation was the work of real thoroughbred Jews or of Christian Jews. And indeed, they prefer the original to the imperfect copy any day. On a similar note, the anti-Semites, it had to be said, were an unpalatable crowd. Quote, indeed, an unappoising, an, 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 an apt, aptizing league, ap, appetizing league, an appetizing brethren, brethren, one would always almost rather be a Jew. Uh, one of the most characteristic of the Jews, Hassan Clever explained, was her almost laughable touchiness. Whoa, I've heard that one before, touchiness. If a Jew calls his dog Stoker, as has occurred, this coarse act is a perfectly permissible joke. If, however, a non-Jew makes as much as an allusion to the crooked nose of the Jews, Jewish circles will immediately talk of anti-Jewish incitement, such behavior. Was impertinent and bore testimony to the lack of tact that was, quote, in any case, a prime characteristic of the upstart, unquote. Okay, Jewish people are upstarts. Uh -huh. In all honesty, he eventually exclaimed, is the legal expulsion of socialists from hearth and home not far worse than some legal constraint on the immigration of the Jews can be. The Jewish deputies subscribed with genu genuine ecstasy to the Kulturkampf and with even greater ecstasy to the anti-socialist incitement. After such special legislation against German nationals, Stammens Genossen had been engineered by Germans, aided and vetted by the overwhelming majority of the Jews in Germany, one now screams blue murder when a few immature people submit a petition calling for special legislation against the Jews. Hmm. It is interesting to observe Hassan Klaver's exact line of argument. Initially, his point is ostensibly this. German Jews have not opposed and indeed supported special legislation against Germans, yet they scandalize the suggestion of special legislation against the further immigration of foreign Jews. But then he states that 
the Jews of Germany aided and abetted the Germans who enacted special legislation against other Germans. This clearly implies that the Jews of Germany themselves are not Germans. The real message then is this. If the Jews saw no cause to protest against special legislation that was being enacted against Germans, those who right, whose right to be here goes without saying, then they certainly have no cause to protest against the application of special legislation to those who right to be here really is of a special nature, i.e. themselves. That is simply ridiculous, quote-unquote. Indeed, one might suggest to be special, but demand exemption from special legislation while supporting the enactment of special legislation against those who constitute the norm surely has little to do with equality. The Jews are no better than the Catholics and the Social Democrats, but they want to be, and unfortunately many perceive of them as better because, well, precisely because they have money, a great deal of money, quote-unquote. Hmm. In gross misappreciation of the actual state of affairs, the liberal historic, historian and outspoken anti-Semite Theodore Mommsen, 1879-1903, had published a, quote, a pamphlet in which he says one should treat the Jews in Germany just like any German tribe, such as, example, the Comoranians or the Saxons. Not even a single Jew would believe that, Hassan Klaver explained demonstrating yet again, yet again what he really did not consider the Jews of Germany Germans. Nor, to his mind, were the liberals interested in the anomalies of Jews' Jewry status as such. The simple truth of the matter was that if, quote, the liberals would not show the slightest bit of interest in them if the Jews had remained poor, unquote. He had demonstrated, as Sinclair reiterated, that the Jews are the least tolerant of all, since they most frequently subscribe the special legislation of recent years, yet themselves are afflicted by an almost lachrymose touchiness. But enough, he eventually concluded. Primarily, he says, we demand that Jewry abandon its noli mi tangere attitude. Moreover, we demand that the Jews precisely because they claim to be persecuted, claim to be persecuted, never and in no way themselves participate in the persecution of their other fellow human beings. It is the duty of the Jews then to oppose reactionary politics in all spheres and selflessly, not just re reactionary economic policies to impede their freedom of exploitation. Uh, well, otherwise called it oppression. Now, while his comments apparently did not register their vaihai dan the ayah, as a publication by one of their own, Hassan Clever's position on anti-Semitism certainly did not go altogether unnoticed. On the 1st of September 1982, Bernstein wrote to Engels that Hassan Clever, who, although not himself a worker, is in close contact with them and has the horizon to go with it, epitomized the potential susceptibility of the social democratic clientele to anti-Semitism. This chap, persistently vacillates between Stoker and Uncle Bernstein, or Dr. Phillips, and one keeps fearing he might one day get irreversibly stuck in one position or the other. Mind you, that would be a surmountable loss. Unquote. We also find a rather cryptic relevant reference in Kautsky's posthumously published recollections, although these obviously need to be treated with caution given that Kautsky did not write them until the 1930s. He mentioned, there's a statement published by Babel and Liebnick on the 6th of November, 1881. In it, they explained that the party had negotiated with representatives of the conservatives and Stoker's Christian social movement during the election campaign in Berlin. The declaration emphatically rejecting any such haggling over votes Stimmen, stimmen shach, shacha, ah, stimmen shacha, Kowski related, had been signed by Babel and Liebnig. Why not ask Cleaver? He then added in parenthesis. That was not explained. The explanation seems simple enough. Babel and Liebnig were both in Dresden at the time, and thus were able to sign the statement while Hassan Clever was elsewhere and could not be consulted before the statement was made public. Nor could Babel and Lipnik wait 
for its response because the anti-Semitic press had already published, publicized the negotiations, and they considered it a matter of urgency to set the record straight. According to Bernstein, House and Clever immediately approved of the statement and did become aware of it. Babel, on the other hand, in his memoirs, makes no mention of Huss and Clever either way. The reasons the statement gave for rejecting the tactical alliance as so often did not concern the anti-Semite stance regarding the Jews, but the fact that their policies were reactionary and militated against the interests of the workers. Since social democracy opposed any haggling over votes on principle at the time, the rejection of this particular tactical alliance in and of itself had no specifically anti-Judeophobic thrust. Arguably, the most remarkable aspect of this entire incident is the fact that the party officials in Berlin had negotiated with the anti-Semites in the first place, so that Babel and Leiblick were now forced to intervene. This incident is generally cited as an example where the party's principled opposition to organized political anti-Semitism. Yet it could equally well be interpreted as an illustration of the fact that even though the party was opposed to tactical electoral alliances on principle, tactical alliances with the anti-Semites was not automatically considered anathema. Conversely, hmm, this, this precedent for the molotov rubinthal Pact. Conversely, the term haggling was presumably chosen to unmask the disingenuousness of the anti-Semites who opposed haggling as a Jewish practice, yet were more happy to indulge in it themselves when it suited them. In short, nothing suggests that Hausen Clever's position was seen as a major issue at the time or that anyone took him to a task for it. We therefore have no reason to presume that he published Der Wahrheit Danaya under a pseudonym because he assumed his position would be insufficiently anti judeophobic to be accepted by his comrades. Naaman suggests that it was simply insecurity that led him to do so. No one in the party seems capable of making an authoritative statement on anti-Semitism. This series of articles was an attempt to deal with this issue from a fresh perspective, which would take into account the socialist outlook, but would also be acceptable to the general public, which had reservations about Jews shared by the author himself. Reservations. <laughs> Yeah, that's one way to put it. Hmm. Okay, to continue. This undertaking invariably entered totally uncharted territory, and therefore posed a risk best minimized, minimized by not as yet making the case under his own name. Hyde, on the other hand, who is beyond doubt the scholar currently on the most intimate terms with Hausenklaver, suggested that he hid behind a pseudonym because he knew only too well that popular anti-Semitism existed within social democracy too, and therefore feared criticism from within his own ranks. In other words, Hausenklaver feared that his pronouncements were too anti-Judeophobic to find favor with his comrades. This would suggest that when it comes to characterizing the attitudes to anti-Semitism prevalent among Hassan Cleaver's peers, the term ambivalent is a euphemism, if ever there was one. The theme of Jewry's duty to stand up for the cause of general emancipation was also popular with Mary. Oh, he's, he's changing uh, direction now. Let's see now, maybe I should pause here. Yeah. Okay, I think that's good for today. So this is part four. I'll continue making this a reading and analysis of the entire book because this is so crucial. I mean, you know, so much of the Marxist left, you know, still believes in all of that stuff from the Second International. 